All right. So yeah, it was Jacksonville, if you've ever been there, it's just such a cool little town. And there's so much to paint down there. And there's a whole bunch of old Victorian style homes, which being the hopeless romantic that I am, um, you know, I just am really drawn to this kind of subject. So I just took a kind of raw sienna, burnt sienna brownish pencil and did a little bit of mapping out. I didn't do a whole lot of drawing on this one because I'm going to do a lot of big shapes with the underpainting. And it's an interesting, on the photo, and when I look at it on my device, on my computer or my iPad, um, it just, it came out warmer because I don't have the most, you know, I have just a regular desktop printer. It's not a really sophisticated printer, but the, it's, the interesting thing to me is the shadow has got a lot, it's like kind of a warm, cool shadow. And usually I always say shadows are cool, 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 but there's, it's on this very warm, warm yellow house. So it's kind of creating an interesting shadow that's gonna be kind of a fun challenge to, to recreate. So before I do that, I want, I have a little strip of sanded paper from one of my scrap piles. And this is what I did this morning. And this is what I encourage you guys to do too. Um, I was just trying to pull out some colors. I'm gonna move this down here for a minute. So this is a kind of a mauve-y, I don't know what it would be called. I kind of play around with some colors before I even start. I do this even at my experience level. So I really like, I'm gonna hold it really close. I really, in this, you know, it's not that blue, it's more purpley in my hand, but um, you can see how it floats in and out of that umber color and it doesn't leave an edge and that tells me it's the same value. When I put it over here, and I think I showed you this in the beginning, but you can see an edge and that means it's a darker value than that swatch. So I really encourage you when you're, you know, get your painting, your, your image or your still life, whatever you're working from and um, you know, map it out on, you know, draw it out as much as you need to, and then take a few minutes before you hit it and play around with these colors and look for, pull out some middle values, some dark values and some light values and put them from your, I call this my stationary palette over here and then my working palette in front of me. So take a little, it doesn't have to be sanded paper to do the testing. It can just be, you know, charcoal paper and do a little experimenting with the color before you go on to your painting. Oh, and I learned another thing. I just picked up this thing I had in my file. I have a file called Pastel Tips. And whenever I get something or print something out, it goes in that file. And I was pulling things out and I found this, it was printed by the Pastel Society of the West Coast, a little postcard advertisement thing. And it has a dozen pastel tips. And I read it when I first got it, but you know, sometimes you know, you just kind of forget about it. But it said, use any keyboard compressed air duster to remove those pastel layers with pinpoint accuracy. And I just happened to have it out because I was cleaning my computer, you know, the, these things. And you don't want to do it in a really small enclosed space because it makes the pastel fly off, but it's amazing. Look at that. Is that I don't know if you can really see it. I'm just taking it all off. Now that's before I do any underpainting. I don't know. Just don't do it and then inhale because it's still it's making some dust. But I did it very close and I did it just so if you're working on a painting and you get something like a one area, try it. But just like I said, don't breathe it in. I do take it outside or just sit really far back from it. It was just a coincidence that happened to work. So there you go. Now that I took it off, I'm going to put it back on. So now I'm going to create these big shapes. I'm using this kind of blue with this mauve interspersed with it. And I'm forgetting about the dappled light because that's going to come later. So I'm kind of, kind of squinting down at the whole thing. Again, and we're all going to refer back to those puzzle pieces that I always talk about. Now inside the window, looking into the house, there's a big darker square. So I'm going to sort of indicate that. 
a little right there. And over here, there's like a door. So those are darker darks. So I'm just going to indicate that. But most of the shadow is going to be these two colors for now, for the underpainting part. I'm forgetting about there's a really cool decorative like wrought iron fence. I'm also forgetting about that right now. That's why I didn't spend too much time drawing because I knew I was going to be doing this big, uh, big shape underpainting. And then I pulled out a very like a ochre, pale, o yo, pale ochre color for the actual building, which is darker than I'm going to end up. It's not the house is not going to be that strong or that dark, but I want that for my first layer. And I'm adding some pink into it a little bit. Same value. We're like mixing it up right on here. And my goal is just to get one layer of color. I'm going to do the same thing with the greens, with the whole greens. I'm going to just look at it as if I squint my eyes, I can really pull out these shapes. There's a big shape of dark shadow leaves. And I'm kind of trying to connect them up a little bit here. It's really going to look like a very abstract painting. Get some color, a little darker version of that color onto the post here. Um, there's some light on the steps. And I'm going to get a lighter green. Well, actually, I'm going to finish with this green here. There's some darks in these forward bushes. really kind of greenish gray color that also is this close in value with that shadow color that I can intersperse. So again, I'm not, I'm not overdoing the, you know, the colors, just a few different colors, close in value. I'm going to pick up a lighter green for the foliage that's in the light. That's a little too dark. Again, not the lightest green I see, but a lighter value. So here, that works out good here. Again, squinting my eyes so I can pull out big shapes, no detail. Okay, so we're getting there. Just want to fill this up. There's all these little vines in here, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. They're going to come later. I think we're going to let this go all the way up. Oops. I'm going to pull out a pretty color for those flowers. Just want to kind of indicate uh, some of them, not the little ones, but just more the bigger ones right now. Okay, so we're almost there. And there's some pretty, the trim color on the house is a warmer version of the, well, it's a warmer color darker than the shadow part of the house, but it's still really close in value. I'm going to kind of indicate the frame, that window frame a little bit, just so I know where I'm going. All right, I don't think I need to do a whole lot more for this part. It's going to require some redrawing, which is I expect, you know, that, that always happens. I just want to indicate this and a little bit of this cool trim work up here that kind of breaks up that big shape, as well as up here. All right. So I can look around and see any big gaps. No, a couple little things here, just a little touch here and there. Again, I'm not, I'm not overpressing on this. It's very light. I'll pull out my handy dandy natured alcohol a little bit. Don't need much. It's a little painting. It's only six by nine. I'm going to pick out one of my brushes. Oops, paper towels. Oh, I forgot paper towels. Don't go away. 
All right, I'm just gonna dab it into the denatured alcohol. Start with the lighter colors, which is the house itself. Again, this one I don't have to be too careful because drips won't bother me on this particular one if I do get too much. Just moistening all the colors to turn them into a paint. Everything covered. So I got my darkest darks there. I can really see where they're where they live. All right, and then I think I got it all. You know, always, I always laugh at this point because this is with, when I used to paint more outdoors and people would stand behind me and watch. This is the point where they'd walk away and just scratch their heads like, what is she doing? It gets a little ugly before it gets beautiful again. At least this is really getting a little ugly, but I know what it's going to be, hopefully. All right, that's about it. Let it try. All right, framing. There's big controversy in the world of framing amongst pastel painters. And it goes like this. There is the, tr the way that I've always used to frame everything. And that would be with a mat, using a mat on top of the painting in the mat works as a spacer between the glass and the pastel painting. That's very traditional. I got away from mats a, lot, a number of years ago because there was always this competition in, in shows between oils and pastels. And um, oils, I wanted to frame my pastels to look more like an oil. So there wouldn't be this whole mental thing of it, an oil is more expensive. I, I price my things pretty close between pastels and oils. So that became a trend too, to not have a mat. Um, but then you have to keep the, you know, keep the glass off. So there's these things that you can buy at, a frame. I buy them at I've Been Framed, which is my mostly framing place. And there's these strips and they're called spacers and they come in smoke, black or clear colors. And when I, when I frame this one, this is, um, if you remember, this is Oscar, and I have this frame that I'm putting him in, it's an older frame I've had for a while. And when I do this one, I'm gonna use the spacers. The other way I'm gonna show you is, it's, it's called passe partat, parto. I'm saying it really awful because I have no good French accent, but it's a French term, and it's a whole different way to frame. And in the framing, in, and I asked this question at the pastel convention, the first one that I went to a few years back, and I would say it's probably a 50-50 split down the middle. There's pastelists that are horrified about not putting a spacer in, and then there's ones that would, that always do the second way I'm gonna show you. But the first way is, if you don't wanna mat it, that's if you're not going to use a mat, and that's still, and there's some pieces I still do matte because they need it and they just seem to need it to open up the painting. So this one is really easy because you just take this long strip, it comes in a five foot strip, it's $5 for the strip that I've been framed. And you take your little wire cutter here and you just snip it aside, you hold it inside the frame. You can see the little lip of the frame inside and it comes with a piece of sticky, paper on one side of it that you just peel off 
and that's the sticky side. And you just lay it inside this lip and press it down. So that's what I would, that's what I'm going to do on all four sides. And then I'm going to put my glass on top of the spacer. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. I'm going to put the glass in here and then I'm going to put the spacer. God, I need to edit that out. And then I'm going to put um, Oscar back in. So there's going to be the glass and then the spacer and then Oscar. So that, so that Oscar's not touching the glass. And that's a very traditional way and very simple do it yourself. The part that's not as simple as cutting a mat. That one I gave up a long time ago. Okay, the second way, this passe parto, um, the trick is to have a strong neutral pH tape. And I use this tape, it says inside it's called artist tape. It's a pH neutral tape that you can also get at the art store. It comes in different thicknesses. This is, I think, looks like a quarter inch or and what I'm going to do with this is which horrifies some pastel painters. I have done both ways and I have not, knock on wood, I must have good pastel framing karma because to, to date, I have not had any problems. Um, so I'm taking, this is Derby, my sister's cat. This is on that pastel Le Carte paper. Um, and I'm putting him on a piece of acid-free foam core because he was never, it was never mounted, it's just the paper. So I'm just going to lay it on top of a piece of eight by eight, cut to the same size, piece of acid-free foam core. And then I'm going to take my glass that I already cleaned, but I better clean it again because just sitting here it gets dusty. And, the, and I use AR glass, which stands for anti-reflective glass. And I switched to that several years ago because when it's just amazing and it's come down in price a little bit. I also get this at Ivan Framed. You have to find your local framer and see if they carry it. Um, but it's just like it says, it takes all the glare away from the pastel painting. So I'm laying this, I think you can see, right? Let me move this up. I'm laying it right on top of the painting and that's what horrifies some people. I think it's okay for smaller pieces. I don't think I would attempt a large piece like this. And then I'm taking it, I'm kind of hanging it over. I hope you guys can see this. I'm hanging it over the edge of my counter and I'm taking this um, artist tape and I'm going to seal it. I'm kind of, I'm making a seal, a moisture barrier because that's the only fear is moisture getting in. But when this tape, is put all the way around. So it's creating a nice bonding seal. All right, so I'm gonna do that. I'm not gonna do all of it today, but I'm gonna do that on all four sides. So he's gonna have a nice seal of tape all around him. And then he will go inside the glass as like one unit, one piece. Once I get it all taped, see how nice. So. It's touching the glass, but it's not moving around. It's not shifting. It's not getting any moisture in it. And then I would also probably put a backing board on here as well. And that's it. So those are the two different options. And you are gonna, you know, my framer won't, pay, won't do anything this way. He's like too scared to do this. And there's a friend of mine, an artist friend of mine back in Chicago who owns a framing shop. She won't do that either. She, she's horrified by that. I'm going to stop the recording for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to come back in now and do a couple of little redraws just for the structure of the house. Just picking up a brown pencil, pastel pencil. Just want to just kind of map out certain things before I hit it with the pastel again. Straighten out that window frame. Just want to indicate a few things here. One of them being kind of where I want the fence and this pillar, this little pillar, that little post that's right in front. It's got some cool shadows on it. Not cool, not cool. I mean, like, not warm, cool, cool, but you know what I mean. I like the shadows on it. Got some dappling on it. 
I don't know, dappled, dappled light has always been a fascination for me because it's so romantic and beautiful and it, but the downside of it is it lasts for like two seconds and then it changes constantly. And that's a challenge if you're painting outside. Okay, a little bit here. Let's see if I know where I'm going here. I'm this up here. I'm just going to indicate these angles a little bit. And I'm going to come back into that middle part, into that shadow area. Because I feel like I have such a good value on there, I don't even have to put a lot of pastel back on there. But what I'm going to do, this is how I would do this. It's like, I want a little cooler color than that. Here we go. This is a very pale, no, it's too green. Very, I, want, I don't want a real strong yellow here, but I want to warm something. Let's try this, okay. And I'm going to start to dapple. And you'll see when I show you the slide, the slideshow, because sometimes, I don't know, it's like to dapple or not to dapple. You kind of have to get enough without getting too much. And again, this is another thing you have to kind of play around with because you can make a pattern and you don't want to don't want to do like a samey samey polka dot kind of look because it's not at all, but you want to get enough in there that enough dappled light to create dappled light without making the viewer dizzy, if that makes sense, because it's a lot. There's a lot of dappled light and it could kind of get chaotic. That's just kind of giving me a focal point. And I want to come back and hit these darks a little bit again. And some of these hanging over green. And I'm so you see me do different kind of patterns with my marks. This is the whole mark making thing. And you have to find your little marks and play with them and vary them. Just kind of build up, start to create a pattern. And I'm going to come back up in here, see where I want to start to put some of the flowers. So I, again, I'm painting this in my mind, I'm like right there and I'm painting on location. So if I were actually really painting this scene on, the, on location, you've heard me say this before, I would just go for the center of interest right away because I'm going to pretend like the sun's going to change the lighting and I'm going to lose that beautiful feeling in here. So I'm going to, this whole thing in here. So I'm going to paint it first. Just like if I were doing a plein air painting. So I have a very cool, cool pink and now I picked up a warm orangey color. So because I see both in those flowers. So I can feel it. To me already, I can, I'm kind of getting the feeling of it, that I'm getting the feeling of that lovely summer dappled light feeling. Really, and I'm always just kind of fascinated with the window because you wonder what's inside the house there. And, I'm gonna, and I see things in the house, but I don't really want to see things in the house. So I'm going to make kind of just some indications of things in the house. And I think I'm going to actually pick up a pencil here. It's a really interesting kind of little wrought iron thing. I want to get that showing. And even that's got like dappled light on it. I'm picking up my charcoal a little bit here. And the dappled light changes color from the house 
onto the uh, window molding, which is kind of interesting too. This whole piece down here seems to be catching light. Tell I'm been getting better at doing these little quick demos because I, in the beginning, I think I was holding my breath, and now I can tell I'm like actually breathing while I'm painting. It makes a difference. I want to get a cool green to mix in because I see some of the foliage has some cool light on it, and I like the play between the warm and the cool. Kind of probably hear the little pitter patter of pastel on the sanded paper. All right, I think I want to deal with the upper part of the house. The sun is really hitting up here, and I knew that I knew that underpainting color was darker than I wanted, but I did that on purpose because I still got a kind of an ochre glow coming through with the lighter, paler yellow on top. That big blob of dark that I laid in there, I have to break it up with the light of the house, create a nice pattern on the house there. <clears throat> so I'm using a combination of a pale yellow and a pale pink, both. So I'm going to follow my shapes that I initially had, you know, my lights and darks, and kind of reshape them and just kind of cascading down here on top of that shadow color. But I really like the, there's like a rhythm here that I see with this coming down and then down. I just really like the flow of that. <clears throat> yellow into here. Come back now and I'm going to get a thing for the wrought iron gate. I need a, that's too dark. I'm going to go to my hard pastels just so I can get a cleaner line. It's hard with the big chunky soft pastels when I'm doing a little itty bitty curly wrought iron dealy thing. And there's like some really pretty rusty colors in there. It's hard to see probably on the screen right now because it's, I can see it much better on my iPad. Oops, wrong color, this color. All right, so then it's just kind of a dance. It kind of feels like a dance to me. It's like kind of creating a, I don't know, dappled light feels like dancing. 
We think of the light as dancing across. And the trick too is to get, you know, enough of the, the fence. I don't need to get every curly cue on the fence, but I want to get enough of the fence, the gate. I guess it's not really a fence, it's a gate. <coughs> Warm front here. I'm going to stick in some of these. I'm using a stick of charcoal here. Because it's these vines that the, you know, the rose trellis vines, whatever they're called. I'm going to stick some warm. I got this cool purple color in these deep shadows here. I'm going to just stick a little warm brown in them. Just get that warm, cool play bouncing off each other. Somehow on a summer day, when you look into those shadows, it's going to seem to have some warmth in it. I have to keep molding and shaping these flowers and these leaves. I'm kind of jumping ahead, but you know, when I get to these, these really soft pastels at the end here, I'm, the technique is kind of a press and roll. And you can tell how soft a pastel is when you do that, because it'll just be like a, almost like working with a palette knife if you have a big glob of oil or acrylic, that's what those last little touches can be with the soft pastel to get the really good highlights and color. I'm going to take a I have this blue pencil. I want to, this is kind of strong in here. Actually, I'm not going to take a blue pencil. I'm going to take more neutral color pencil. Kind of a purple, pale, very pale. Just want to mellow this part out a little bit. I don't want it to jump out at me. I want it to recede because it's in the shadow. even seems to have a, just a touch of light on it too, which is kind of cool. Cool. Okay, I should stop saying cool because then you're going to think I'm talking about cool colors. So here I'm putting a like a light umber with a cool blue to create that shadow color. It's kind of a combination, but, get, but they are the same value, so they work well together. Pause, come back and 